Welcome church, friends, and family both near and far to the Black Health Symposium. It's good to see you all once again. As always, be sure to like, comment, and share this broadcast with your friends and family so that they can get in on today's good information as well. Let's go ahead and see what the discussion panel has in store. All right, y'all. Welcome tonight on February the 25th. The Youth Ministry is presenting its Black History Month Healthcare Symposium, and we have several guests tonight that have joined us from Good Shepherd, and they have all this energy on this Friday night to answer questions and to sit with the youth as we give you some really, really valuable information. So we are going to get started. So we are honoring our past by securing our future. And how do we secure our future? by really taking control of our health. So we're going to begin with our welcome from Elena. On behalf, good evening. My name is Elena McIntyre. On behalf of Reverend Moore, the youth ministry would like to welcome you tonight to the 2022 Black History Month Virtual Healthcare Symposium. The youth ministry would like to share with you information about Black physicians, scientists, dentists, nurses, and psychologists that paved the way. We also want to take time to recognize Good Shepherd's own Good Shepherd's own healthcare professionals who have been working tirelessly during before and during COVID to improve the health of their patients. Physical and mental health are linked to one's outlook and quality of life. So join us as we engage in conversation with, with some of the CSRA's top healthcare providers. We hope that you all will be encouraged to continue or strive for the health lifestyle. Again, welcome. Michelle. All right, our scripture will be read by Chandler. Uh, good evening, everybody. Today we'll be reading Psalms 139, 14 through 14. For you created my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Next is John 1, 2. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that you, may, that you may go well with even as your soul is getting along well. Thank you, Chandler. We'll have a prayer by McKenzie. Father, we praise you for this event and your purpose for it. We know that when we gather together, you always have a divine agenda. We love you for that, Father. That even when we have done what you ask, the results are much greater than we ever could have imagined, even in failed attempts. You blow us away with your faithfulness to provide what we need. Our prayer today is that your will be, will be done through this event. Take what we have prepared and multiply our efforts as only you can steer our intentions to align with your righteous will. Remind us of your faithful provision when our efforts fail us or fall short. May all glory go up to you when we reach the finish line and climb over benchmarks. Blank us with your peace today. Father, keep us physically safe and guard our hearts and minds from pride and selfishness. Keep love at the for forefront of our minds today and the guiding lights for all we set out to accomplish and celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so our guest panelists today are Dr. Makerson, 
Miss Miranda Emery, Dr. Michael Holman, Miss Ashley Bethay, Miss Karen Ryans, Miss Tasha Boone, Dr. Victoria Burt, Dr. Allen, Reverend Dr. Ken Allen, and Miss Tanika Williams. And they are our guest panelists here to answer the questions that the youth have created and submitted and in hopes of helping our congregation and our community to improve their health. So we have some breaking news. Let's see what that breaking news is. So according to the Center for Disease Control, African-Americans are living longer overall. The death rate for African-Americans has declined about 25% over 17 years, primarily for those age 65 and older. The death rates based on the leading causes of death, such as cancer, heart disease, and stroke have also decreased. However, even with these improvements, new analysis shows that younger African-Americans are living with or dying of many conditions typically found in older white Americans. The differences show up in African-Americans ages 20s, in the age of 20s, 30s, and 40s. So that is really, really intriguing and alarming that younger African Americans are dying. So according to the CDC, when diseases start early, they can lead to death earlier. Chronic diseases and some of their risk factors may be silent or not diagnosed during these early years. Health differences are often due to economic and social conditions that are more common among African-Americans than whites. For example, African-Americans are more likely to report they cannot see a doctor because of cost. Overall, African-Americans have a longer lifespan in, than in the past, but younger African-Americans are dying earlier. So that is our breaking news for tonight. And so we're going to transition into our information about our past dentists, doctors, and physicians. And we're going to start with Raymond. Good evening, everyone. My name is Raymond, and I will be reading about Robert Tanner Freeman. Today, Robert Freeman was born in Washington, D.C. in 1846. His parents changed their last name to Freeman once they gained their freedom. Robert Freeman was the first Black man to enter the Harvard Dental School in 1869. After he was rejected from two schools due to the radical description, he became the first African American dentist after graduating from Harvard. He was one of only six to receive the doctor of dental medi medicine degree after graduating, Tanner moved to Washington, D.C. and practiced dentistry. Den dentistry. Dentistry until his death on June 14, 1872. Perfect. And so Robert Freeman contracted a waterborne di born disease and passed away. And so what's interesting is he was so young. So Raymond introduced our <laughs> dentist for tonight. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Deborah 
Makerson and Miss Medrain, Miss Miranda Emery, dental hygienist. Good job. Unmute for us, Dr. Makerson. Thank you, Raymond. Good evening, Good Shepherd. Um, I'm Deborah Young Makerson. I'm a proud member of Good Shepherd Baptist Church. Um, I have been practicing dentistry for over 35 years. I was born and raised in Augusta, Georgia. I attended the local schools, graduated T.W. Josie High School, attended Payne College, graduated from the Medical College of Georgia in 1980, and I have been practicing dentistry at 1119 Druid Park Avenue, and I also have a practice in Millen, Georgia, and in both places I practice with my son, Reginald. I have three children, Ricky, um, who is married and with two children, um, and also my son, Reginald, who's married, who practices with me, and I have a daughter, Dana, who's a nurse, and she's in um, Atlanta, also Ricky's in Atlanta. And um, throughout with having Good Shepherd as my family, I've just had my proud moment is that the Good Shepherd family, I've been able to work with them over all these years. And especially in this last two years with COVID, they've been coming through the office and with us not meeting physically in church, I feel like I've still had that connection because I've seen my Good Shepherd family in church and that's meant in the office. So that's meant so much to me. And I'd like to thank them for that. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am Miranda Emery. I am a registered dental hygienist in the state of Georgia. Um, I Grew up here in Augusta, Georgia, been a proud member of Good Shepherd for a long time. Um, let's see, I graduated from Hepzibah High School, uh, went to Georgia Southern and received my bachelor's of science in biology and a minor in chemistry. I also attended the Medical College of Georgia where I received my bachelor's in dental hygiene. So I've been practicing for about 14 years now. Um, some of my hobbies is, of course, singing. You may all, you all may have seen me on um, our live streams for Sunday service. Um, I also have a pet a dog named CJ. He's a pit bull, but my baby, he's not here with me right now, so he won't be a distraction. But I look forward to answering your questions that you all may have. Thank you so much. Okay, so a couple of facts. More than nine in 10 older adults have cavities and one in six have untreated cavities. Older non-Hispanic, Black or Mexican American adults have two to three times the rate of untreated cavities as older non-Hispanic whites. Based on data from 2011 to 2016 for children ages two to five years old, about 33% of Mexican American and 28% of non-Hispanic Black children have had cavities in their primary teeth compared to 18% of non-white or non, I'm sorry, non-Hispanic white children. And it says 42% of adults have had some form of gum disease. Among adults aged uh, 65 and older, the rate of gum disease increases to 60%. So Cameron is going to introduce James McCoon Smith. Hello, guys. My name is Cameron Tyler, and I will be reading about James McCoon Smith. Dr. James McCoon Smith was an African-American pioneer in public health and healthcare. James McCoon was born on April 18, 1813 in New York City. He attended the African Free School for his basic education and graduated from the school with 15 honors. After graduation, James McCoon smelled salt but was denied admission to several American colleges due to his race. 
He then managed to raise money to attend the University of Glasgow in Scotland. After returning to New York City, Smith quickly emerged as a powerful anti-slavery and anti-racism organ organize, organizer, auditor, and writer. In 1863, he moved to Ohio to accept a position as a professor of anthropology at Wilberforce College. James McCoon Smith died of heart disease at age 52 on November 17, 1865. And one of our pharmacists at Good Shepherd Church is Dr. Reverend Ken Allen. Thank you, Cameron. So Reverend Dr. Ken Allen cannot be here tonight, but he has a video and we will be so excited to show that video very shortly. He wanted to make sure he was represented and he did an excellent job. So a couple of facts about <clears throat> pharmacy. So according to a survey published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, an alarmingly high number of elderly Americans are not taking talking to their physicians about problems they are having with prescription medications, including unwelcome side effects, affordability or perceived efficacy. And medication literacy is the degree to which individuals can obtain, comprehend, communicate, calculate and process patient specific information about their medications to make informed medication and health decisions in order to safely and effectively use their medications regardless of the mode by which the content delivered. So whether it's written, oral, or visual, it's saying that medication literacy is all about whether or not you can obtain it, understand it, talk about it with important persons, your healthcare team. So Lily is here to introduce Hello, my name is Eliana Green, and today I will be telling you about Rebecca Lee Crumpler. Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the first African-American woman to earn a medical degree in the United States. Rebecca was born on February 8th, 1831 in Delaware. She was raised by an aunt in Pennsylvania. In 1869, Rebecca established a practice and focused on studying the illnesses affecting poor women and children. In 1860, Rebecca was admitted to the, Engl to the New England Female Medical College. She graduated with a medical degree in 1864. Rebecca, Rebecca Lee Crumpler died on March 9th, 1895 in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. In 2019, in 2019, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam declared March 30 National Doctors Day, the Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler Day. And I would like to introduce and I would like to introduce Dr. Victoria Burke. <coughs> she is a nurse practitioner. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I am Victoria Burke. I am an advanced practice registered nurse certified in family nurse practitioner and cardiovascular nurse practitioner. I just so happen to have a doctorate degree, but I am a nurse. I um, was a registered nurse for 17 years prior to going to school to become a nurse practitioner. I've been a nurse practitioner for 16 years. 
I currently work University Hospital cardio, Cardiology Department with um, four cardiologists, Dr. Mag Bowman, Dr. Brannon, Dr. McNear, and Dr. Chandler. I also work part-time at the Augusta University College of Nursing. I am um, a graduate of A.R. Johnson High School, second graduating class. I stayed here and went to school as well. Um, to, I went to Augusta College. It was then MCG, graduated with my master's degree from Georgia Health Science University, graduated with my doctorate degree from Georgia Regents University, all in the same place. I enjoy working as a nurse practitioner I'm married and I have three children and two wonderful grandchildren, five-year-old Christian and two-year-old Carter. I love working uh, with children, so I miss being with the Children's Church at Good Shepherd. Can't wait till we're back together. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have a couple of important facts here. There are 3,059,800 nurse jobs in the nation, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and occupation is growing much faster than other professions. Nursing is considered the most honest and ethical profession in the United States and nurses can obtain a doctorate of philosophy degree in nursing which is a research focused doctorate or a doctorate in nursing practice that is the highest available degree in nursing. Okay, Chandler is going to introduce Daniel Hale Williams. Hello, every, hello everyone, good evening. My name is Chandler Wood and I will be reading about Daniel Hale Williams. Daniel Hale Williams was the first successful heart surgeon. He was also the first black man to perform a successful heart surgery. Daniel Hill Williams was born January 18, 1856. He was raised by both of his parents, Dale Hale William Jr. Wait, Daniel Hale William Jr. and Sarah Price. In 1883, he earned a medical degree from Chicago Medical School affiliated with Northwestern University. In 1893, he performed and succeeded the first open heart surgery on a man named James Cornish. He successfully saved the man without current technology of blood transfusions and other tools. In 1894, William moved to Washington, D.C., where he was appointed the chief surgeon of the Freeman Hospital, which provided care for formerly enslaved African Americans. Williams was a volunteer, a volunteer professor at Meharry Medical College for more than two decades. He became a charter member of the African of the American College of Surgeons in 1913. He had a destabilizing stroke in 1926 and died five years later in that August of 1931. I will be introducing Dr. Michael Holman, who is a cardio cardiologist. Thank you. Is that my cue? Well, good evening, Good Shepherd. Uh, yes, sir. You can hear me? Okay, good. Uh, good evening, Good Shepherd. I'm uh, also a proud member of uh, Good Shepherd Baptist Church, and I am a cardiologist, uh, which for the younger folk mean that I'm a doctor who works on the heart. Um, I'm, I'm a uh, product of the uh, Columbia Richland County public school system uh, where I graduated from W.J. Keenan High School, first graduating class. 
Uh, I attended the University of South Carolina for my undergraduate degree in biology and minored in chemistry. Uh, afterward, I attended the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for my doctorate degree. Uh, afterwards, I did my postdoctorate work in internal medicine at Emory University in Atlanta and uh, subsequently came to uh, MCG and completed my cardiology fellowship, uh, which was a second postdoctorate. Uh, I enjoy uh, practicing cardiology because uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a good variety of medicine. Uh, you get to see some really interesting things. There's a lot of technology involved in it. And for the younger folk uh, who, you know, have a sense of intrigue about how things work, the heart is a very interesting organ. And uh, that kind of caught my interest at a very young age. And uh, that's the reason I decided to go into cardiology. Uh, we see a variety of different patients uh, in uh, my practice field. Uh, I started off as a interventional cardiologist, uh, which means that uh, I did um, various invasive procedures such as cardiac catheterizations, uh, stents, pacemakers. Uh, and uh, as I got older and started slowing down a little bit, I transitioned into general cardiology, which is what I do now. Uh, so now I don't really go to the cardiac catheterization lab. Uh, which is the place that we take people who are having acute heart attacks and, and stopping them in the process of uh, uh, the heart attack occurring. Uh, now I do more um, uh, diagnostic and preventive uh, cardiology, which also is very interesting. Um, uh, I'm sort of uh, in the twilight of my career now. I'll probably be practicing for another two or three years. Uh, and after that, I'll probably just be doing part-time work and I'll be around for any questions that you guys might have. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Okay, I have a few facts to include in our presentation tonight. The health of your brain and your heart are connected. By keeping your heart healthy, you also lower your risk for brain problems such as stroke and dementia. Adults who sleep less than seven hours each night are more likely to say, to say they have had health problems, including heart attack, asthma, and depression. Some of these health problems raise the risk for heart disease, heart attack, and stroke. These health problems include heart attack, heart disease, again, and a stroke. And lastly, a large and growing body of research shows that mental health is associated with risk factors for heart disease before diagnosis of a mental health disorder and during treatment. These effects can arise both directly through biological pathways and indirectly through risky health behaviors. So Carter is coming to introduce to us Mary Eliza Mahoney. Hello, I'm Carter Wood. I'm gonna be talking about Mar Mary Eliza Mahoney. Mary Eliza Mahoney was born in 1845. She was the first black woman to finish nursing training in 1879. She also was the first black members of the American Nurse Association. She worked in New England Hospital for Women and Children. She was considered by many as a pioneer of nursing and voting. In 1908, she was a co-founder of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses. She served as a Director of Howard Colored Orphan Asylum for Black Children in Kings Park. She was also one of the first Black women to vote in Boston following the ratification of, nine, of the 19th Amendment of 1920. In 1976, Mary Eliza Mahoney was introduced, was, in, was inducted 
in Nurses Hall of Fame by the American Nurses Association. I'll be um, introducing um, Miss Karen Ryan. He is a nurse. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Good evening. I'm Karen Ryans. I am a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse for 26 years. I am married to Fitzgerald Ryans, the minister, minister at our great church, Good Shepherd Baptist Church. I have two wonderful children, and now I have a grand dog. And I have, uh, my daughter is trying to study to be a doctor as well. She's at Mercer University. She graduates undergrad in May. I've been working mostly um, at university in a perioperative uh, setting, and that's where nurses get patients ready for surgery, and then they also work in what's called PACU, recovering, nurse, um, recovering patients after they've had surgery. I actually love nursing, and no, um, there's no days that are, are the same. Every day is different. You have different patients with different issues. You can have a stable patient one minute, which can turn to be an unstable patient. And I actually love what I do. And thank you for having me on the panel. And I gladly answer any questions I can regarding nursing or taking care of patients and educate patients after surgery to help them get back to their best health. Thank you. So we have a fact. Another fact about the nursing field. Okay, it says RNs can work in a variety of healthcare settings. You have hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, outpatient settings, physician offices, clinics, insurance companies, the government, community health, elementary or high schools, universities, correctional health facilities. So Mackenzie is here to introduce Estelle Massey Osborne. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Boyd. I'll be teaching you about Estelle Massey Osborne. Estelle Massey Osborne was born May 3rd, 1901 in Palestine, Texas, and was the eighth of 11 children. She was the first black nurse to earn a graduate degree. In 1923, at 22 years old, she joined the first nursing class in St. Louis City Hospital. In 1926 or 1927, she moved to New York City to teach at Lincoln School of Nursing and Harlem Hospital School of Nursing. In 1932, she married Dr. Bedford N. Riddle. In 1934, she worked as a researcher for the Rosenwald Fund and then returned to Homer T. Phillips Hospital in St. Louis to become the first Black director of nursing. In 1954, she became an associate professor of nursing education at the University of Maryland. On the 7th 12th, 1981, she died at the age of 80. The person I will be introducing is Tasha Boone, and she is a nurse administration. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Tasha Boone, and I'm a proud member of the Good Shepherd Baptist Church, where I serve on the healthcare ministry as well as the children's ministry. I have been practicing as a registered nurse for 23 years. I am a native of Hancock County, which is Sparta, Georgia, which is about 60, 70 miles west of Augusta. I attended, um, and I'm an alumni of Payne College, wherein I received a bachelor's degree in biology. And then I attended the Medical College of Georgia School of Nursing, where I received a bachelor's degree of science in nursing. Um, I am currently I do have a master's degree as well um, in healthcare administration from Troy State University. 
I am currently working at the Charlie Norwood VA Medical Center, which is a great joy serving our veterans. I have been a nurse for 23 years. I have been in nurse administration for 16 years. The one thing I love, the, it's a lot of things I love about the nursing profession. You are always learning. Um, um, there's always different scenarios and different experiences. But as a nurse administrator, what is really exciting to me is that I have the ability to set forth policies and procedures that's going to protect our patients, um, make sure that they're getting the care that they need, and ensuring that um, as a nurse, I'm the biggest advocate for our, vet for our veterans and our patients. Um, I'm also very instrumental as far as with um, seeing nurses grow in their careers and being a, uh, a mentor and a um, advisor to nurses during a nursing uh, career path. Um, I am very, very happy um, that Dr. Woods thought of me to be on this interview panel and I'll be open to any questions that you may have. I am married and I do have three kids, um, Justin, Bryson and Zaria. And um, I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a couple of more facts. <laughs> Try to educate, right? So there are over 100 nursing professions to choose from. There are 104 specialties. And because of this, nursing can be highly customizable and many nurses move laterally to another specialty or they build their own education and move up, which allows for a lot of flexibility. General nursing practices are universal all over the world. A licensed nurse can essentially practice anywhere in the U.S. and the world. Nurses walk on average four miles a day. In a 2006 study, which is old, it's a little old, but that's okay, um, found out that 146 nurses studied walk, um, walked an average of four to five miles during a 12-hour shift. For comparison's sake, most Americans walk just two and a half to three miles during the course of an 18-hour day. So nurses get in a lot of steps. Okay, and we have Patrick to introduce Hazel Johnson Brown. Hello, my name is Patrick, and I will be introducing Hazel Johnson Brown. Born October 10, 1927, died August 5, 2011. Parents, Clarence L. Johnson and Garnett Henley Johnson. Home, a rural Quake, Quaker town of Marvin near Westchester, Pennsylvania. Education, Harlem Hospital School of Nursing, Columbia University and Teachers College. Service in the U.S. Army, 1955 to 1983. As a child, Johnson Brown set a goal to become a nurse. Discipline, diligence, unity, and the pursuit of education were important household values. She took care of her four brothers and two sisters. She found domestic work outside the home when she was 12 years old. Her life involved working in the military and several medical positions. In 1979, she became the first black female brigadier general in the United States Army. On a personal note, Johnson Brown was a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc. She was married briefly to David Brown, but the union ended in divorce. He later died of lung cancer. She spent her years living with her sister, Gloria Smith, in Wilmington, Delaware. Johnson Brown passed away at the age of 83 after a short battle with Alzheimer's disease. Her interment took place in Arlington National Cemetery in, on, November 11, on November 2011. Thank you, Patrick. 
I'll be standing in for Taylor. Let me make sure. Taylor? Okay. So Ernest J. Grant is the 36th president of the American Nurses Association, the nation's largest nurses organization representing the interests of the nation's 4 million registered nurses. Dr. Grant has more than 30 years of nursing experience. He previously served as the burn outreach coordinator for the North Carolina JC Burn Center at University of North Carolina. Grant holds a BSN degree from North Carolina Central University and an MSN and PhD degrees from University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He was inducted as a fellow into the American Academy of Nurses in 2014, and he is the first man to be elected to the office president of the American Nurses. All right, I will be reading for Kennedy also. So Francis Sumner, born December 7th, 1895, and he died January 12th, 1954. He was the first African-American to receive a PhD in psychology in the United States. He established an independent psychology program at Howard University. He completed vast amount of research which counteracted racism and bias psych uh, psychological studies in African Americans. He is known as the father of black psychology. He served as the chair of the psychology department at Howard University. One of his students was Kenneth Clark whose studies were important in the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case. So tonight we'll be introducing Tanika Williams, who is a mental health counselor. Hi everyone and thank you for having me as well, Quick Shepherd. Um, my name is Tanika Williams. I am a licensed associate professional counselor. I'm a nationally certified counselor. I have certifications in um, events, alcohol and drug counseling, and I'm also a board certified telemental provider. So that means I can provide therapy electronically as well. Um, that was recent during the pandemic, trying to capitalize off of that. Um, I'm a member of Good Shepherd. I've been a member there and an active member for about 10 years. Um, I've also been counseling for about the last 10 years as well. I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia, a bachelor in psychology, and I have a uh, a uh, master's degree from Troy University and it is in mental health and clinical counseling. Um, again, like I said, I have been counseling for about 10 years. I love understanding our behavior and why we do the things that we do. I love answering those questions about society and sociology and kind of comparing those things. Um, currently, I am stationed in Atlanta right now and I work for uh, DBHDD and I work for the Office of Behavioral Health and Federal Grants and Funding. Thank you. Okay, so of course I gotta educate. <laughs> so I'm gonna add a couple of facts and we are going to soon transition into our answer question portion. Very excited. So although the terms are often used interchangeably, poor mental health and mental illness are not the same. A person can experience poor mental health and not be diagnosed with a mental illness. Although, okay, in mental and physical health are equally important components of overall health. For example, depression increases the risk for many types of physical health problems, particularly long lasting conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Okay. That might be me again, y'all. <laughs> so Vivian Theodore Thomas was an American laboratory instructor of surgery at John Hopkins University in Baltimore. He was born as the grandson of a slave in Louisiana, working as a carpenter and subsequently as a laboratory technician after the Great Depression and the loss of his savings, which derailed his plans to become a doctor. 
In his role as a laboratory technician, he overcame challenging personal circumstances to become an innovator in pediatric cardi cardiac surgery, despite having no formal college education. He played an important role in assisting Alfred Blaylock and Helen Tossing in the development of the Blaylock Tossing shunt, a procedure used to improve the survival of children with cyanotic congenital heart defects. He acted as a teacher and mentor to a generation of surgical residents and technicians who went on to become leaders in their fields across the US. A television film based on his life was premiered by HBO in 2004 titled Something the Lord Made. And tonight we're going to introduce Ashley Barnes Bethea, who is a laboratory scientist at Good Shepherd Baptist Church. Good evening. I'm Ashley Bethea. Um, I am also a proud member of Good Shepherd. I've been a member of Good Shepherd since uh, 2002, so a long time. Um, Let's see, I'm from North Augusta, South Carolina. Um, I actually went to lab school while I was in the military, go Army, um, through the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Um, I love the lab field because it's ever changing and you learn something new every day. Um, also because I'm not really a people person, so I like working behind the scenes, but still being able to help the patient as, at the same time. Um, which is ironic because I currently work uh, at the Blood Donor Center on Fort Gordon and I have a whole lot of patient interaction. Um, so what I do there is uh, I collect blood products and test those blood products and uh, prepare them for transfusion uh, for sick patients. Um, let's see, I'm married to Calvin. We have two little girls, Aubrey, and Kaylee, and we have another little girl on the way that is due in June. Um, and I'm excited to answer your questions tonight. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs> okay, so a couple of, of interesting facts. It is estimated 60 to 70% of all decisions regarding a patient's diagnosis, treatment, hospital admission and discharge are based on the results of the test medical laboratory scientists perform. Medical laboratory scientists perform complex tests on patient sampling using sophisticated equipment. Physicians and medical laboratory technicians in diagnosing and monitoring disease processes as well as monitoring the effectiveness of therapy. Areas of medical laboratory training include microbiology, chemistry, hematology, immunology, transfusion medicine, toxicology, and molecular diagnostics. Okay, so before we get started with our question and answers, I want to make sure to read this disclaimer to our Good Shepherd family and to anybody who watches this video. This symposium, the presenters and Good Shepherd Baptist Church and all of its entities do not provide personal medical device. It is intended for informational purposes only. This is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment by your healthcare provider. Never ignore professional medical advice from your personal healthcare team in seeking treatment because of something you have read or heard during this presentation. If you think you may have a medical emergency, immediately call your doctor or dial 911. So we are getting into our questions and so our kids are going to join us. I'll jump in when necessary, but we have our list of questions for Dr. Holman. He's gonna start us off with heart health information. So Patrick and Carter.
So is there someone going to ask questions or you just want me to just answer the questions that are here? Yeah, I, I'll go ahead and ask them. I think they're probably, it's Friday night. <laughs> so I'll ask them. So what are the risks of having heart health issues? And what are the most common factors that lead to those heart health issues? Well, first of all, there's a variety of different uh, heart uh, issues that you can have. Uh, but the first one that usually comes up is uh, coronary artery disease and uh, heart attacks. That's the most common question that we get. But coronary disease is just one type of heart disease that we treat. Uh, we also have valvular heart disease, uh, hypertensive heart disease, infectious heart disease. Uh, there's a variety of different uh, types of disease that you can have. And as related to coronary disease, uh, risk factors are very important in terms of uh, determining whether you uh, develop uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, smoking, uh, being uh, excessively overweight, or having a, a family history of premature coronary artery disease are the most common risk factors that we uh, question people about when they come into the office. Uh, and uh, want to ascertain their risk of developing heart disease. Thank you. And um, question, go ahead. Number two, do emotions like love or sadness affect your heart? Well, uh, that's really a difficult question because everybody have emotions, uh, you know, love, sadness. Uh, but one of the things that certainly can affect heart health is acute stress, uh, acute anxiety. Uh, those types of uh, intense acute emotions are certainly associated with the occurrence of certain types of cardiac rhythm disturbances, such as uh, uh, fast heart rhythms, uh, and in some cases, uh, intense uh, acute stress can result in uh, a heart attack uh, type of syndrome that we call Takotsubo syndrome. It is mostly seen in uh, women uh, and they manifest symptoms very similar to a heart attack. But the good thing about this particular condition is that in most cases, uh, the heart function uh, returns to normal in about three months and there's really no permanent damage. Uh, to the heart muscle, but they present to the emergency room with very uh, similar symptoms of heart attack. Uh, and when you look at their EKG, the EKG shows signs of heart attack. Uh, you take them to the cardiac catheterization lab and do a cardiac catheterization on them. And what you find is that all of their arteries are completely patent. In other words, they have no blocked arteries that, that you would see in the situation of an acute heart attack. But when you look at the wall motion of the heart, the, the function of the heart looks exactly like you would see in an acute heart attack. But if you bring that person back and recheck them in about three months, uh, the heart function usually goes back to normal. Number three, how do you maintain a healthy heart? Well, maintaining a healthy lifestyle is the most important um, thing about uh, maintaining a healthy heart. Uh, obviously, you should not smoke cigarettes. Uh, you should have a good exercise regimen. And when we talk about exercise, we're mainly talking about aerobic exercise, such as walking, biking, swimming, uh, elliptical training, uh, anything that gets your heart rate up and keeps it up for about 30 minutes, about four or five times a week will be good for your health. Um, uh, your diet is very important. Uh, staying on a low cholesterol, low fat diet is very important. Uh, staying away from, uh, you know, red meat, fried foods, uh, foods that are high in cholesterol and saturated fats are certainly not good for you. Uh, drug abuse uh, is something that uh, is often implicated in uh, heart health uh, and uh, drugs like cocaine can produce heart attacks in very young people. In fact, when I was a, a resident at Emory uh, back in the early 80s uh, during the crack cocaine epidemic, uh, we were seeing people coming in at 16 and 17 years old with heart attacks, which is unheard of. 
Uh, so uh, drugs like that uh, are not good for you. Um, and, um, you know, keeping your weight down and uh, uh, is, is also very important because a lot of people don't realize that once you exceed your ideal body weight by more than 30%, uh, you create a diabetic and hypertensive uh, uh, state, uh, even if you don't have a genetic predisposition to develop those conditions. So uh, those are the things that I would say that are uh, important in terms of maintaining a, a healthy uh, lifestyle. Number four. Yeah, so, oh, um, what are early signs of Uh, well, the two most common things that we see uh, as cardiologists would be uh, congestive heart failure and uh, coronary artery disease. And the signs of uh, uh, the early signs of cardiac disease would be uh, a decrease in your exercise capacity. Uh, in other words, if you're able, if you're normally able to walk two miles in uh, 30 minutes and all of a sudden uh, you can't walk uh, two blocks in, in 10 minutes, then obviously uh, something has changed uh, in terms of your cardiovascular health. Um, uh, uh, unusual shortness of breath associated with activities that you normally are able to accomplish without having any symptoms uh, would be another sign. Uh, another sign would be uh, waking up in the middle of the night short of breath or having to sleep uh, sitting in a chair. Uh, those would be early signs of, uh, of, of heart disease. Uh, pain in your chest, uh, particularly pressure-like discomfort in the middle of your chest associated with exercise uh, is another sign of uh, uh, heart disease and uh, we call that angina. Um, if you have uh, issues with your heart beating out of rhythm uh, where you feel, you know, your heart's beating all the time so you normally should not feel your heart when it's beating in a normal fashion. But if you have an unusual awareness of your heartbeat and you can feel your heartbeat and you feel like it's beating fast or beating irregular, then that's usually uh, an indication that you have some type of cardiac rhythm disturbance. Uh, those are the signs that I would say are early signs of, uh, of cardiac disease. Number five. Are heart problems more common in the black community compared to other um, ethnicities? Ethnicities? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, uh, the, the biggest problem that we see with cardiac problems in the African American community has to do with access to uh, health care. Uh, in general, uh, the issues that we see are social issues. Uh, and for that reason, there's the perception that there's a disproportionate representation of cardiac issues in the African-American population. But that has to do with lack of access uh, and, not able, uh, and, and people not being able to afford medications and not being able to monitor the uh, conditions that they have uh, appropriately by seeing a physician on a regular basis. Uh, so I don't think that that's a I don't think that heart problems are more common in African Americans. I just think that uh, we we see it more because uh, people just don't take care of themselves uh, as good in the African American community, whether it be economic issues or whether it be access to care. Number six: Are heart issues linked to the sudden death of young athletes? Yes, they are, and. Uh, a lot of you all probably, uh, one of the most famous cases of heart disease related to a young uh, athlete was, uh, you all probably remember Lynn Bias, uh, who played for the University of Maryland uh, basketball team. And uh, the most common thing that we see in athletes that lead to uh, sudden death is a condition called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And what that means is that the heart muscle is disproportionately thick and stiff and it doesn't relax uh, like it should. And the heart muscle is so, so thick that when the heart con contracts, it actually obstructs on itself. And when that happens, uh, what happens is you have uh, cardiovascular collapse in shock and, and those patients die very suddenly. 
that's a genetic problem and that's something that can be screened for. Uh, in fact, uh, when I first moved to Augusta, we used to do a lot of uh, uh, cardiac screening for uh, all of the high school athletes here in Augusta. And we would just do an EKG and an echocardiogram to screen for this uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Okay, this, these questions are for our nurses and, and any of our physicians who would like to, to chime in. But how do you lower your high blood pressure? I'll start. Um, one thing, as Dr. Coleman mentioned to you, is basically your diet. There is a diet called the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. With that diet, it's one that is lower in salt and higher in potassium-rich food. So the DASH diet is a good diet to follow. Um, and it is a lot of foods higher. I didn't quite understand what you just, what you just said. Can you repeat it? It includes vegetables, fruits, I'm sorry, someone needs to mute. Thank you. Okay. It includes eating a lot of vegetables, fruits, lean meat. Um, so diet is one option. The other option is exercise. If we were to do exercise, and American Heart Association recommends that we get 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise. And Dr. Homan mentioned that. That includes exercise that gets your heart rate elevated. That could be 30 minutes, five days a week, 22 minutes every day, or 50 minutes three times a week. But exercise um, in itself can actually lower the blood pressure by five millimeters of mercury with, um, you all don't indulge, but people that indulge in alcohol, if they avoid indulging in alcohol, that can lower the blood pressure as well as not smoking. So um, smoking actually narrows the vessels and can cause the a blood pressure to be higher. Weight loss, if a person were to lose two pounds for every two pounds they lose, they can lower their blood pressure by two millimeters of mercury. So healthy lifestyle can lower the blood pressure. Why are African-Americans more likely to develop diabetes than other ethnicities? Uh, I think I'll take that one. Uh, I, don't think that, uh, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, uh, what, what I see now, and, and I'm sure uh, Vicki and uh, Karen can attest to this, is that, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, young people today are, don't have a lot, a, a good exercise regimen. They don't eat correctly. And for that reason, they tend to be obese. Uh, and we see a epidemic of obesity, particularly in the uh, not just African American young population, but also in the Caucasian uh, uh, youth as well. And, and what we're seeing is a ramping up of diabetes in all young people. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, obesity. I think I just mentioned earlier that uh, once you exceed your ideal body weight by more than 30%, the risk of diabetes goes up significantly, even if you don't have a genetic predisposition to develop diabetes. Um, and you can calculate how much you should weigh. If you're a uh, female, you get 100 pounds for the first five feet, and for, uh, for every inch above five feet, you get five pounds. And if you have a heavy frame, uh, or you're kind of a muscular, thick person, then we give you an extra 20 pounds for that, or 25 pounds for that. And for males, you get 106 pounds for the first five feet, and six pounds for every inch above. Uh, five feet, and you can do the calculation from, calculations from that to determine what your ideal body weight should be. Uh, what are some complications associated with diabetes and hyperextension? 
I'll take the first part of that question. Basically, being in surgery, I see so many young people now getting amputations, and that is one of the complications of diabetes when it's uncontrolled. Uncontrolled diabetics suffer from uh, kidney disease, uh, eye disease, um, and what I see a lot is uh, amputations, losing limbs because of uncontrolled diabetes. Other complications of diabetes can result in um, problems with your heart, as well as um, problems with your eyes, your, uh, your vision. For diabetics, they, they do advise that we get uh, diabetics to get diabetic retinal exams um, every, could be annually or every two years. Um, so diabetes can have an impact on your eyes, your kidney, your heart, as well as what um, Karen was indicating as far as with your vascular, um, many of your blood supply um, to your extremities, your, 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 um, your legs, your feet, your hands, wherein you develop things like neuropathy or tingling um, feelings in your um, hands and feet. So um, those are some complications of diabetes. What are the risks of being overweight? I believe um, Dr. Holman did um, go over that question already. Um, there are a lot of risks um, with being overweight, the cardiovascular disease, the diabetes, the um, hypertension. And when we look Look at oh, being overweight. Um, he told you about calculating your body mass index. But one thing we also look at is your waist circumference. A woman's waist circumference, um, old standards actually said it should be 35 inches or less, and a man's waist circumference should be 40 inches or less. However, new guidelines are going at your waist circumference should be half of your height. So um, if you're a short person and you had a waist circumference, a female and your waist circumference was 35, that's not equal to someone that's tall. So half of your height um, is the new, moving to the new guidelines. So you wanna um, make sure you're doing what you can to avoid being overweight. And overweight is with a body mass index, um, basically from 26 to 29. And obesity starts at a body mass index of 30 or more. You know, why do some African Americans choose not to have an annual checkup? And by doing that, does that impact one's overall health? There are many reasons why um, um, African Americans, as well as um, any other American, um, choose not to um, have an annual preventative examination. It could be access to care, meaning that um, transportation, it could be finances, it could be that um, they do not have um, health insurance. Um, some um, persons are skeptical about um, um, hospitals, doctors, um, some of it is familial, meaning that um, they, their, their grandparents didn't believe in going to the doctor, so they don't go to the doctor. Um, so it's many different reasons why people choose not to um, um, get annual examinations. And what was the second part of that question? And by not getting annual checkups, do that impact their health? That definitely impacts the health. Say, for instance, if you don't, a lot of times patients think, oh, I feel fine, so I don't need to go to a doctor. But perhaps after the, um, after the age of 50, most individuals or adults need to get what's called a colonoscopy, where they look at their, um, their colon. And if they don't have that done, and they end up having colon cancer, that's something that could have been avoided and corrected and fixed if caught earlier. So those kind of things can affect overall health because of course you can die from having colon cancer. And if you would have had that colonoscopy at your annual 50 year checkup or whatever the limit is, I believe it's still 50, that could have been caught 
um, by removing the polyps and they could live. And then I also think that just basically patients, some patients think that they don't feel bad, so they don't need to go to the doctor. But if you go to the doctor and see your doctor annually, and they have like what's called a baseline of, for instance, an EKG, your baseline EKG, if something were to change, they would have a EKG to compare it to. And then getting lab work, they could um, even just annual lab work, they can see where problems or diseases are starting. Like for instance, kidney disease, your creatinine could be elevated or something like that. What? I just want to emphasize one other thing uh, that uh, Ms. Boone mentioned uh, about uh, distrust of the healthcare delivery system. That's one thing. Uh, if you look at some of the disparities of uh, healthcare uh, and you compare African Americans to any other races, uh, we find that African Americans have a fundamental uh, distrust of the healthcare delivery system. I'm not saying that all African Americans do. But in terms of the underrepresentation of African Americans in large clinical trials, uh, if you look at the way that a lot of these trials are designed, uh, you find that there is always an underrepresentation of African Americans in those trials. And so a lot of African Americans look at that and they really don't trust the healthcare delivery system. And I think that leads to a lot of the disparities in terms of how. African Americans uh, uh, turn out in terms of um, you know morbidity and mortality if you look across the board in various disease categories. What exercises improve circulation? A few exercises that come to mind when I hear that question are biking, walking, swimming, jogging. Um, those are the the. Um, ones that come to mind when I think of circulation, definitely walking. I would add to that anything to have you moving more. I mean, if you, instead of driving around the parking lot trying to get a closer parking space, walk further away, get a little walking in there, take the stairs if it's just a, a few stairs versus trying to find an elevator, just moving more. If we as much as we sit and watch television, if every time there's a commercial, if we were to get up and even walk in place doing that two to three minute commercial, we would improve our circulation because it merely makes our heart beat a little bit more, which pumps more blood throughout the body. Yoga is another form of exercise that helps the overall health. So the um, new thing of Sitting is just as bad as smoking. So move more. Uh, my last final question is, how important is diet to someone's overall health? I'll take that one as well. Um, <laughs> our ancestors, yes, they ate um, maybe a lot of fried foods. They cooked with lard and things of that nature. But our ancestors, they work from sun up to sundown. We think that we can eat the bad foods and we don't move. We have the remote control, the microwave, um, and we don't walk anywhere. We're going to drive everywhere. So we don't move as much. And so our diet um, play a big role in our health and developing um, diseases. We have the technology that can help us to live longer, but we mess ourselves up by our diet. Uh, sodas. If you drink a lot of sodas or sweet drinks or beverages in general, you're adding unnecessary calories. If we were to look at how many calories we get from drinking beverages and you're trying to lose weight, cut out the sodas. I also say, yes, we do need to eat fruits and vegetables, which are healthy, but do not or try to avoid drinking smoothies. Those are glorified milkshakes when you're having the bananas, the blueberries, the oranges, the apples, all in a mixture. The eating of fruit provides us more fiber. 
So it's best to eat your fruit and not drink your fruit. If you want to make a smoothie, make it with only one fruit and a lot of green vegetables, whether it be broccoli, spinach, kale, whatever. So look at what we're eating. Avoid the fast foods. Fast food restaurants are generally higher in fat, salt, and sugar. Read the labels on things and you will be amazed at the amount of calories, the amount of salt, the amount of carbohydrates, the amount of fat that's in foods. Um, the portion sizes are very important because, I mean, you're supposed to, when I was growing up in high school, we had ice cream that came in these little, I guess, um, two to four ounce containers. Now people look at that and think like, oh, that's not an ice cream serving. So they want to eat three or four of those. So we really need to look at what we're eating, how much we're eating, as well as what we're drinking, how much we're drinking, comparing that to our physical activity. And if we change our eating habits, because you can't exercise a bad diet, meaning you can try and do all the exercise you want, but if you continue to eat a lot of bad foods, you're not going to be able to maintain a healthy weight. So diet, plays a role in the development of early cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, and a lot of other medical conditions, cancer and things of that nature. And I just wanna to add to Dr. Burt as far as with portion control, many times when we're going out to eat to restaurants, they may give you two to three times your portion control. So when you're looking at the types of meats that you're eating, eating more lean meat, and that, that lean meat should be the size of the palm of your hand, no more than four to five ounces. So if you're uh, one of those people, I, when I see people going to these all you can eat places and they got three or four meats on a plate, it, it's, it really is not healthy. So really portion control, eating more lean meats, fish, chicken, and um, your fruits and your vegetables and cutting out a lot of the car carbohydrates from um, potatoes and rice and uh, overabundance of it. So it's always about portion control. Y'all, thank you so much for providing these wonderful answers to our youth and our community. Is everyone okay to continue or do we need a slight, a brief break? Push on. Okay. Yes. Shown to the end. Okay. So we are moving into our dentistry and oral health and hygiene questions. And Mackenzie is going to take the lead on these. I think she's an inspiring dentist also. I think that's what I heard. So Mackenzie, are you ready? I'm ready. Um, right. the, the first question is, what are misconceptions in the Black community regarding oral health? I'll take that one. I think a lot of people think, um, well, we're going to lose the teeth anyway. And we don't have to lose our teeth anyway. With proper oral care, you can have your teeth for the rest of your life. Uh, I have many patients that have come in in their 80s, 90s. I think I had a patient that was 100 and two come into the office and he was brought into the office by his 90 year old sister who also had her her teeth so proper oral health and proper physical health will um increase your um lifespan also and i think that's a, a misconception that we will lose our teeth. And also as far as young, um, our young patients, a lot of times people will think, well, the kids are just gonna lose those teeth anyway too. We know that they lose those teeth. Most people are familiar when they're like six, losing the front teeth. <laughs> but, and then a lot of times the kids come in they have cavities in the back teeth and they say, oh, they're gonna lose them anyway. It's important that those teeth stay and they're lost at the proper time. The front teeth are important in development as far as speech and development. And then the, the posterior teeth, 
need to be lost at their proper time because they will help to guide the permanent teeth in coming in. Okay, Dr. Mason, I would also like to add um, that some people think that brushing their teeth hard is actually better. Um, and it's really not about brushing your teeth hard. It's about uh, your technique. Um, your technique is to remove plaque from the teeth. Um, also, um, some people, they say, oh, my teeth aren't bothering me, so they don't go to the dentist. Uh, that's the misconception because you can have uh, abscesses that are forming at the roots um, that you may not feel any pain from, but it wouldn't be um, discovered until you have dental x-rays taken. So those are some other misconceptions that people have. Great point. Um, the next question is, how is oral health connected to one's overall health? The germs and bacteria that are found in the mouth are also found in other parts of our body. If we can lower those germs and bacteria, um, we can um, prevent problems in other areas. If you have a lot of germs and bacteria in your mouth, that means it's going to flow through the bloodstream right. and it will affect the, um, the heart, mm -hmm. the brain, the kidney, the liver, and our other organs. And so it's just not about the, the mouth. And that's um, very important that we are following proper dental procedures as far as um, brushing after every meal when we can, flossing at least once a day um, and having proper uh, dental visits at least twice a year. The next question is, why don't some people prioritize oral health? Um, I would say that some people don't prioritize oral health um, because a lack of understanding of how important it is um, with the connection of the health of your um, body. Um, sometimes there is um, like disparities, like, like um, some others have said, just transportation, um, financial um, issues that one may have. Um, and sometimes just they, I would even say, uh, scared people are uh, I think that's a lot that happens in the black community that you have a lot of people that are afraid of the dentist especially some of our older uh, generations who may have had bad experiences growing up so that could be some reasons and then th those um, fears are oftentimes passed on to children and then their children's children so it's a continuing uh, generational thing that happens sometimes Dr. Makerson uh, would you like to add no, I, I agree with you. Um, the thing is, it's, it's like, like you were saying about abscesses and problems that may be going on. And it's, it's really prevention. If we come in and we're getting x-rays, we're getting checked, it's prevention. A lot of us, we're gonna go in and we're gonna make sure that car is, the oil is changed every 3,000 miles or whatever the recommendation is, the wheels are rotated. If that little engine light comes on or a little check light comes on, you're gonna take that car or truck in, but we won't do that with, the, with our mouth or even with our body and we should. And you wanna do prevention. Mm -hmm. And that's very important as far as oral and physical health. The next question is, what oral hygiene practice is often overlooked the most? Ooh, I got that one. <laughs> flossing, 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 flossing. You have a great number of people that will brush their teeth all day, but they will not pick up that floss to go in between the teeth. And oftentimes I, I tell my patients, um, would you want to eat off a plate that's only 60% clean? And oftentimes they say no. So um, our teeth have about five surfaces that we uh, clean. But if you're um, not cleaning the sides of the teeth, um, then you're missing 40%. So um, flossing is very important along with brushing. So um, I would say that's one of the most um, 
often overlooked practices of oral health that people miss out on is, is flossing. I agree. The next question is, what are some bad oral hygiene practices that should be avoided? Not brushing. Um, a lot of us, are a lot of people will go to sleep without brushing their teeth. Mm -hmm. you definitely, that's very important because that's when the, the bugs and the bacteria in your mouth are gonna use that food that you've left there. It's gonna feed on it and that's where the cavities are gonna start forming. So it's very important that we're brushing and flossing before we go to bed at night. Um, not going to the dentist, um, knowing that you might have a problem fearful that you know, what, what's gonna happen when you go. Um, those are some bad practices, yes. Um, I would also like to add uh, eating candy, frequently snacking. Um, you're just basically bathing your teeth in, in a pool of sugar, of carbohydrates that the bacteria thrive on. Um, also uh, nail biting. Um, what, it, what nail biting does, you know, your nails have bacteria up under them. And so if you're biting your nails, you're just introducing more bacteria, harmful, potential harmful bacteria into the mouth. And also just uh, most times when you're biting, you're using your front teeth. So it's like an edge to edge bite that's happening and it's causing wear of the enamel, uh, which could potentially cause cracks, um, fractures. Um, also uh, using your teeth, to break, uh, what are those things called? Uh, crab legs. Uh, a lot of people like to eat those and they just take the teeth and start using them. Well, or eating a lot of uh, the hard cracklings, those things, uh, you have to be careful because your your teeth, even though they're like one of the strongest things in your body, but you know some things can cause um, damage to your teeth um, and using your teeth as tools is, is one of those things. So just be careful with that. Um, also smoking. Uh, smoking is very bad. It, it, it stains the teeth for one. Um, not only that, but it can cause um, dry mouth. And usually um, when you have dry mouth, then the bacteria, it can, you know, further dry, um, thrive in the mouth um, when there's conditions that uh, give it that. So um, smoking is bad. Also heavy drinking alcohol. Um, people who, um, alcohol is okay every now and again, but if you are a constant drinker of alcohol, a lot of times you will have, um, uh, what is it? It's kind of like a, a sugar. It, it turns into a sugar. And again, the bacteria, they thrive off of those kind of things. So you want to be careful with that as well. And also add um, our young people, a lot of the energy drinks, yeah. a lot of the Powerade, the Gatorade, even though it doesn't yeah. taste like it's very sugar. Right. If you look, it has like 26 grams of sugar. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of sugar. And then our adults, we have our uh, adult, I call them adult sippy cups. When they're sipping on tea all day, uh -huh. you just have an adult sippy cup. We have to avoid those things also. Mm -hmm. Number six is how can gum disease be prevented? Well, no, gum. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go no, ahead, Doctor. Let our hygienists. Oh, okay. Um, well, gum disease can be prevented by making sure that you are regularly flossing and brushing your teeth. Um, I would say, at the very least, floss at least once a day. Um, I personally, I like to floss after I eat because generally that's when I know food is. Uh, stuck in between the teeth. Um, that's best practice. Um, um, brushing at least uh, two times a day, possibly even three times a day. Um, some people feel awkward taking their toothbrush to work to um, brush their teeth after they've eaten their lunch. But I personally, I do it um, not just only in the dental office, but when I used to work retail, I had my traveler uh, toothbrush in my pocket and I would go to the restroom. I didn't care. And I would just brush away and everybody say, oh, you're always brushing your teeth. Well, you know, it's, it's good for you. So um, brushing your teeth. Um, flossing regularly, also um, going to your dentist regularly, at least twice a year, um, and um, having your dental examinations and your regular dental cleanings um, to keep you 
in a preventive state um, to, to prevent gum disease. So those are some best practices. Excellent job. You just answered number seven. I'm sorry, Mackenzie. I wanted to slide in a question that's not on there, if y'all don't mind. Okay. Okay. I know a lot of people love eating ice. Oh. Can you tell us what that does to the teeth? That falls right in line with... Um, the crackling and and eating crab legs it's just mm -hmm. going to destroy your teeth mm -hmm. it's not it your teeth were not made to crack on crackling or our crab legs or ice and a lot of times um there's a deficiency when mm -hmm. uh of iron when most people are they're anemic and they're just craving that um mm -hmm. that ice so there are other things that are going on there too but it's not very good for the teeth. Right. Thank you, Mackenzie. Did you have any more questions that came to mind? Yes, actually. Um, how long does it usually take to get completely white teeth? Okay. Well, <laughs> that's a different question. Um, I would say it could be part genetics. Um, sometimes just your your at home care, um, what you're doing. Um, a lot of times, some of the foods that we consume have um, natural, you know, pigmentations to it, so they could cause stain to your teeth. Sodas um, cause a stain. A lot of people who like to drink coffee, um, you you will notice they you know have stain on their teeth. Um, let's see coffee stain, wine, even smoothies. Um, some people who like to put the blueberries and the blackberries um, and, and adults, you know, when they drink wine and things, uh, that those things cause stain on the teeth. Um, so oftentimes you just have to make sure that you're um, using your best practices of brushing really well and flossing in order to get a healthy um, periodontium. But now I will also say this, um, Drinking, look, they said they say drinking milk is good for you. It makes your teeth whiter, but hey, I don't know. Um, just just make sure you're brushing well and going to your dentist regularly for your cleanings, um, and that can help you have a, a white smile. Thank you. You're welcome. Did we ask the last one or answer the last one how often you should visit the dentist? Yes, Miranda answered. Um, <laughs> All right, mm -hmm. great. But you need to emphasize that because people, <laughs> I know people don't often do it. So twice a year, right? At least. At, at least, yes. At least twice a year. Yes, okay. and some people. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Mm, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say real quick. Um, some people who are being treated for periodontal disease sometimes they have to go to the dentist a little bit more frequently. Thank you. So these are the set of questions that Reverend Allen answered. I'm not gonna repeat these because I believe he goes through these in his video. So we're switching the screen over to his wonderful YouTube production that he sent in for us. So Hi, my name's Ken Allen, and I first of all would like to thank the Youth Ministry of Good Shepherd Missionary Baptist Church for inviting me to participate uh, within the Black History Month Healthcare Awareness Forum. And I've been a pharmacist at University Hospital here in Augusta uh, since 1989. I graduated from the University of Georgia School of Pharmacy. Go dog! I've been asked a series of questions that I'm going to answer uh, for you. The first question is, what can a person do to help a loved one that struggles with prescription drug abuse. First thing that needs to be done is to talk, T-A-L-K, talk. Uh, what you need to do is to talk it 
uh, over with the person uh, that you love and because you love them, explain to them what you're seeing. They may try uh, again to uh, let you know that what you're seeing, you're not actually seeing that, but by you talking with them, confiding in them that this is what you see, the signs that you see and your concern and your love for them and everything. And that may eventually spark some conversation between the two of you where they may readily admit that they may actually need some help, but that's what you need to do is talk. Beyond talking, of course, pray. And then beyond talking and prayer, there may be a third party that the two of you together can come to that particular person and to let them know of your concerns and that uh, you would like to assist in getting them some help. Uh, concerning that particular issue that you may see. But the greatest thing that you can do is talk along with prayer. Second question is, why is it important not to flush prescriptions down the toilet? What uh, medications, and not only just prescription medications, but any medications, what that does by flushing it uh, down the sewage system, it eventually gets back into the water system. Uh, what it will do is it will affect animals, it will affect fish that we consume, uh, it will affect plants, different things of that nature. So any medications that you uh, are not taking any longer, rather than flushing them down the toilet, which will eventually get back into uh, the water system, uh, a lot of uh, retail pharmacists will do is they will uh, have you to bring those medications certain times of the year, maybe twice a year, they'll let you know that you can bring those prescription medications to them and they will destroy them. Uh, generally, the way that they typically destroy them is by burning uh, the medication. But talk with your local retail pharmacist to see when those bring back days are. And like I said, Generally, they may be once to twice a year. So if there are any medications that you're no longer taking, what you do want to do is you want to secure them uh, in a place that uh, children, that uh, anyone uh, cannot just get them their hands on that particular medication and wait until those days come up within the calendar year. The third question is concerning what are the signs of substance abuse? And that basically uh, goes with the fact that anytime someone is not taking a particular medication as prescribed by their physician, that is considered to be substance abuse. As an example, it may even be um, what some people will say as little as if the doctor says take one a day and we decide to take two a day and it's something that you know about that they're no, uh, not supposed to take uh, no more than just that one a day, that is considered to be abuse. So anytime, again, that you take any prescribed medication uh, outside of the way that the prescription reads on the label, that is considered to be actually abuse. The next question is, uh, why is knowing how to read a prescription so important? Um, technology has made it such that uh, doctors rarely write out by hand prescriptions anymore. Generally, what they'll do is they'll dictate that particular prescription or type that particular prescription, and you generally will get a typed out one that you can actually read uh, yourself. There used to be a day where uh, the physician would write by hand uh, the medication, the dosage, uh, the uh, frequency that the medication is supposed to be taken, how many refills uh, the patient will be allowed. But that generally, uh, that day, kind of has gone back um, in the past and we no longer really do that that much anymore. So, uh, but it's still important to actually read the label on the prescription such that you take it correctly. Um, again, if it's to be only taken once a day, that's uh, the way that it should be taken. And sometimes we have the mindset that if one is good, two is better. Um, not in the case with prescription medications. Prescription medications must be taken only as directed 
by your physician. The next question is, why do people avoid taking prescribed medications? And it's not only just, you know, prescribed medications. People tend to avoid certain medications, typically due to the side effects that result from taking the particular medications. And that's what they're trying to avoid. Again, talk it over with your pharmacist, talk it over with your physician, uh, with your nurse, uh, to letting them know that whenever I take this particular medication, this is what happens. Because every medication may not be for everybody. So again, uh, talk it over, talk. You got to talk, you got to let the prescriber, you got to know the one who uh, even fills the prescription, know uh, what that particular medication does for you because we want you to avoid any harmful side effects. Yes, there are some medications that may make you sleepy, may make you drowsy, uh, but the pharmacist or the physician or the nurse, someone should alert you of the fact that, hey, do not operate heavy machinery, do not drive, uh, do not make any drastic decisions while you're taking this particular medication. And then the last question in regards to prescriptions, how important is it to communicate all symptoms to the doctor? Um, that's pretty much uh, what I've already kind of uh, alerted to uh, a little bit earlier as far as side effects are concerned. Anything um, that occurs while you're taking that particular medication, if it's affecting your breathing, if it's affecting your vision, uh, you notice something with your skin, it may be a rash, uh, shortness of breath, whatever that particular medication does. If you take the particular medication and you're not feeling like your normal self, talk. You need to let uh, your physician know. Because again, every medication is not for everybody. And again, thank you for allowing me to participate. I hope I've uh, answer your questions uh, satisfactory. Uh, if there's anything that I can ever uh, do uh, for you, just let me know. Don't hesitate. Thank you again so much. God bless you. Bye-bye. All right. So Tanika, we have several questions for you. And the first question is, what is the difference between mental health and mental illness? Hi, Maya. Thank you for asking that question. So mental health is just like an umbrella term. It's an overall um, kind of term that includes our emotional, our psychological, and our social well-being. So essentially it affects how we think, how we feel, and how we behave, which is how we act. Um, a mental illness, of course, would be any, um, I guess, counterintuitive measure to that. So the difference between like what is physical health and physical disability. So it's that kind of same token. So mental illness would be a disruption in that area that I just explained what mental health is. Thank you. I like that analogy. And can people stabilize a mental illness simply with medication alone? I would not recommend that. Usually mental health is uh, through like of effort. Um, usually there's a system of care somewhere in there and it's a collaborative effort, like I said. So medication is usually one aspect of it. There's usually some form of counseling, some form of family therapy. Depending on what the issue is, um, you want to kind of hit all the areas of that person's life. So medication alone wouldn't just be a simple um, fix. Thank you. And if a person was unable to go to therapy... How would he or she be able to help themselves if struggling with depression or past traumas? Um, another question says if they were not able to, um, but I would say go to therapy first. Um, there's always the way there's telemental health therapy, there's services where you have um, therapy at your jobs, where in most jobs it's free. Um, you maybe have a free number of sessions. If you have health care, usually there's a free number of sessions somewhere nestled in there as well, too. Um, and there's grant funding for free health care. Um, I actually work for an agency that does it for the state for those that cannot afford health care. So it is possible. But if you cannot, um, if you don't have access to it or you're in a rural area or something of the sort, a ways to do with that, um, talking to a friend, something as simple as that, talking about your day, sometimes it may be the difference between uh, a bad day and a bad moment. Um, 
just being able to talk to someone. Journaling is really important. Some of the doctors and physicians mentioned earlier, exercising is a huge way to promote um, positive feelings. It releases those endorphins, the positive ones that we like, like dopamine and all that. So that's a positive way to kind of get out of that depressive state as well too. And something really simple, doing something you love. Depression obviously is um, the absence of I don't necessarily say hope, but essentially it's the absence of hope. So do the things that bring you joy, essentially. So if going to feed animals is something that you enjoy doing or going to the park and people watching, then go out and do more of the things that you love um, if you're not able to see a therapist. Thank you for the information about the teletherapy. I don't don't know if I phrased that correctly, but being able to access mental health care um, in a variety of ways. I just wanted to add, I know a lot of people don't think that they can get access to mental health care. So I appreciate you reviewing that for everybody to know that there is definitely a way. I've seen so many teenagers, especially in, as an educator, who they just don't think there's any kind of way to get that. So I, I really do appreciate you putting that information in there. Um, number four is the way African Americans deal with their mental health generational and or connected to historical events. And then there's a lot of misconceptions about how African Americans deal with their mental health status. Both. Um, there's no simple answer to, to that. So it's both. I believe it's generational based on those historical events. Um, Oppression obviously is a huge piece, even though I never experienced slavery, my ancestors did. So naturally that that oppression and the way they raised me and the the way they reared me, their perspectives, their worldviews still influenced me to this day because generationally it affected how my mom raised me, how my grandmother raised her. So essentially those things do affect you um, in a sense. There's also historical events with distrust and mistrust with African-Americans being experimented on. We have the Tuskegee trials where we have you know been injected with diseases thinking we were being injected with uh, vaccines and things of the sort. So there's a number of reasons why we have um, historically been shown not to trust figures of authority. I believe now there's a, a shift in that because we're realizing that mental health is something that's beneficial to us. And we have a lot of um, agencies now promoting mental health, especially when it comes to suicide, um, domestic violence and things of the sort like that. Um, so I think now there's a shift, but To answer the question, both. I think both things play a major role in African-Americans as a whole, just our trust in um, Therapeutic Alliance. That led me to a question that's not on here, Tanika, and I just feel compelled to ask. So we are definitely heavily involved in, in our church. And of course, we all are believers, but I do want to question or ask how do you connect the two um, in regards to seeking therapy as it relates to how Christians sometimes not all but there are some who rely on um, religion as a way to combat mental health issues as opposed to seeking professional health? Um, My answer with that is very similar um, to kind of what I said before about the physical health. If you see someone with a gunshot wound, you wouldn't just stand and pray over them. I'm assuming you would take them to the emergency room and get them immediate attention and have some professionals that know how to sew up some sutures and maybe get the bullet out. And I'm pretty sure you have some people that know what they're doing to do that. Praying would be a part of the process, but you would let those medical professionals kind of do what they're supposed to do. No different from therapy. If there's a problem that is bigger than us, which most of us have, whether it's a financial problem, a job related to work, whether it's an educational problem, problem with your family, or even a personal problem um, because mental health like I said it encompasses all of those things there are avenues and there are people out there that are trained to assist you with those things church folks we have a tendency sometimes to pray away everything but again like I mentioned before you wouldn't just try to pray away cancer or pray away a gunshot wound you would try to get some immediate assistance so if I am on the verge of you know thinking about suicide or something like that I wouldn't just tell someone to pray I want them to sit down and and talk to someone and and hash it out and discuss what those issues are. So I believe if we think of it 
in that same sense of urgency as we do any other physical ailments, our mental, our mental ailments are just as important as those. And there's scriptures in the Bible um, as well that talk about it as well. Um, 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, fear but of power and of love and of sound mind. Having sound mind and being in your right mind, we always talk about those things. Sometimes it takes professional help, especially if you're dealing with things, giants that we talk about in the, in the Bible, those giants that are huger and bigger than us. Um, and then in the Bible, it talks about as well, getting wisdom from those that, um, you know, have counsel and higher um, affirmations and closer faith than, than we do. So I think it's a huge piece of it. It's just the person and making it more normalized in our community as well. So I think it relates back to the previous question that you asked. Um, there's still stigma attached to it. And so if we can kind of think of it in the same sense as we think of physical health, I think those stigmas will kind of be diminished. All right, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, number um, five and six, I'll uh, go ahead and read both of those. Should people with possible mental health concerns go ahead and seek therapy and phys, um, in psychology, psychological treatment? And then number six, what would you recommend to deconstruct the notion that Black people don't have mental health issues? Um, I would say um, the first thing is the awareness, uh, being aware of what those uh, issues look like and what they present like in different communities. So having that education, even if it's just, you know, going to workshops that we have at our local churches or picking up a book or Googling something online, or even just that thing that, you know, as African-Americans will have it, we'll know like, okay, something ain't right about so-and-so. We might not know what it is or have, you know, a name to it, but we know something's a little bit off. Um, and investigating those things and just kind of asking questions about them. So, I would say that's a huge piece of it. Um, yes, people with mental health concerns should seek therapy. Just like I said, if you have a gunshot wound, you would go to the hospital and seek medical attention. So no different. Your mental health is just as important as your physical health. Um, so I believe you should seek help at any aspect of it. Um, usually, it's a lot easier to prevent something than to... Um, try to treat it once it's already happened. So if you notice those issues are there and they're prevalent, go ahead and seek that therapy. Um, to answer the second part about the notion of um, mental health issues, we aren't impermeable to, to anything. If I think everybody should seek therapy because I think all of us have some things that we need to unpack, especially African-Americans, African-American women, um, for instance, because how society kind of views us. So there's a lot to unpack with that. Um, just societal roles, just in general, the fact that they're killing us all the time, that's not normal being able to see that on TV all the time. So I think all of us uh, should be able to seek therapy um, in any sense. And it's not a sense of weakness. So just normalizing it again, um, to answer that question, just normalizing it and talking about it and having those conversations in our community and saying it's okay, you know, if something's a little off, go talk to somebody about it. Thank you. Number seven, how is anxiety diagnosed and what can teens do to cope with anxiety? So I, I, I know I purposely put that question on here <laughs> because what I'm seeing as a high school teacher is that a lot of uh, youth children are anxious more so than what I recall seeing when I was 17, you know, 16 years old and so whereas we did what we were told and asked to do because we knew it was important students now teens now are you know able to say nope i i'm this makes me anxious i'm too i can't do this i can't stand in front of people i can't talk i'm worried about what others are going to say and what others are going to think and so i've noticed that there is a very um interesting situation going on. I don't want to say epidemic or anything like that, strong words, but it's a lot of children who are so anxious that they won't even pick up a pencil and do their work. And I just want to, to get your feedback and your honest opinion about that, especially since we have our children on with us tonight. And so it's diagnosed a number of ways. You have to present a certain number of symptoms because they have generalized anxiety disorder and then they have different anxiety clusters um, that present with, and they could be um, 
attached to other disorders as well. So you can have bipolar with an anxiety detachment. So there's, I mean, an attachment. So there's no kind of one size fits all. Usually there are some signs, uh, feeling of restlessness, um, being easily fatigued, uh, problems with sleeping patterns, being irritable, mu muscle tension. Sometimes people have diff difficulty concentrating, their mind goes blank, nauseousness. So you can present a number of physical symptoms and um, psychological symptoms as well too. To answer your question about the, this generation, I think a huge piece of it, um, I know you guys don't want to hear it, but a huge piece of it is social media. Um, like you mentioned before, our generation, we actually had to go out in society and be present. We had to deal with the rejection, the issues, and those types of things that come along with normal milestones of life. And so for us, kind of created that extra layer of, um, I guess, armor, if you will, with us. Uh, so we didn't have as many anxieties. This generation, they can kind of hide behind a computer screen. Um, no, I mean, not saying that we can't either, but this generation has the luxury of being able to hide behind a computer screen and not really deal with those anxieties and those social awkwardnesses that we had to deal with before. And so in a sense, it is great because it allows you to connect with people in places that you can only dream of visiting, but it also takes away that physical human aspect that we kind of had growing up. And that's a normal part of adolescent functioning and growing up, going through those milestones in school, going through those experiences of rejection and um, embarrassment or whatever those normal emotions are that you deal with in school, you get to hide behind social media and not really have to deal with those. So naturally when I am faced with dealing with people in a social capacity or aspect, I'll be 10 times more nervous. Other aspect of that as well too is substance use is a huge piece of it as well too. Most substances like marijuana, vaping, cigarettes, um, the fun drugs that they I have now, I'm not super young, so I don't know all the names of the drugs. Um, but a lot of the side effects of those substances is anxiety. Um, marijuana, huge substance, huge side effect of that is anxiety. Um, and over time, if you use that stuff for a while, think of it, their mood, um, their mood changing substances. So if I'm constantly changing my mood, I never have to deal with them. In the absence of those substances, I'm gonna have be overwhelmed with that mood and have excess feelings of that. So I think that. Those two things play a, a major factor in it as well, too. All right, and our last question is for teens, young young people, and the older generation. So I kind of equate social media, like just always looking at it, with keeping up with the Joneses. So that's kind of what uh, the, you know. The older generation was like, you you always in somebody's business. Um, we're all guilty. <laughs> but so how does social media and keeping up with the Joneses affect teen and adults mental health? It's not just a teen problem. Oh, it's not just a teen problem. It is all of us. So again, thinking about just our minds and how they work, all of us, minus social media, all of us already have an array of things that we're dealing with, whether we are going through adolescence, puberty, dealing with issues at school, whether we're an adult dealing with bills, lifestyle, pregnancies, marriages, divorce, like just transitions in life, all of those things. So we already have those things that we're dealing with. Then we have society on social media telling us that we're doing it wrong. We're not pretty enough. We're too fat. We're not eating the right foods. We should be vegan. We should do this. We're not funny enough. We're not those things. So you have society and social media telling you all these things are telling you what to buy. So you're being overwhelmed, and overstimulated with so much information. And eventually it kind of overloads you and we don't even know. So eventually we've, you know, we find ourselves feeling sad about something that we didn't even know we wanted, but but social media told us that we did. And so now we're, we're depressed about something that we didn't even know that we wanted, um, a life that we didn't even know we wanted. We're depressed about money that we didn't even know we wanted to have because we're looking at those types of things. The mind is very fragile. And so when you're constantly overstimulating it with information, then that tends to have an effect on it in a number of ways. And it can affect your self-esteem. Um, again, social media is an, a picture. It's a snapshot of a person's life. So if I took a picture on the days that I dressed the best all the time or the days where I ate the greatest food or the days where I went to the best places, of course, my life would look like it's the greatest. I'm not showing you the days where I only have 10 cents to pick the ramen noodles um, or I have to choose between gas and something to eat. I'm not showing you those days. And so naturally, for some people who live in that world who don't realize social media is not a place, it's an idea. For some people, being able to differentiate between those two is a hard reality. And so I think, yes, it does affect our mental health um, tremendously. Thank you so much. And we are on our last uh, session and that is with our laboratory scientist, Ms. Ashley. So Raymond, are you here? 
Yes, ma'am. All right, you ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it's on you, buddy. Question number one. What do lab scientists do on a daily basis? Um, so that's a very broad question. Um, it actually depends on uh, where you work as a laboratory scientist. Uh, laboratory scientists can work in a variety of different healthcare settings. They can work in a uh, hospital clinical lab. They can work in doctor's offices. Um, we can work in blood donor centers. Um, we can work in forensic laboratories, uh, reference laboratories. So that, that list of duties changes uh, depending on what type of laboratory you work in. Um, but just in general, uh, what lab scientists do is uh, we examine and analyze blood and any other body fluid, uh, any bodily fluid that you can think of, urine, sputum. Um, we examine all of those. Uh, we examine tissues um, as well as cells. Um, we're in constant communication with the physicians and nurses. Um, we relay results to them. Um, Sometimes we also have to call um, for more information. For example, in the laboratory, we receive very limited information about the patient simply because we don't see the patient. Uh, we don't know what their history is. Uh, so sometimes, especially if we get an abnormal result, uh, we have to call that nurse or physician and ask for some background information to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, we utilize microscopes and other high precision lab equipment. So that means we use all this sophisticated uh, lab equipment, but sometimes that equipment breaks. And so we, we have to learn how to troubleshoot. Oftentimes we have to learn how to fix those instruments um, so that we can get back up and running and delay patient care uh, as uh, little as possible. Um, we cross match blood for transfusions meaning that uh, to put it simply, we mix uh, a donor's blood and that patient's blood that's gonna receive that blood. And we make sure that that blood doesn't clot. Um, and if it does clot, uh, it signifies that that uh, patient will have a, a blood uh, transfusion reaction. Um, and so we have to do that to be able to safely uh, transfu transfuse blood to patients. Um, we also, monitor quality assurance programs to monitor and ensure the accuracy of our test results. So that just means that um, every day or every shift or three times a day, however your lab determines, we have to perform what we call quality control. And basically that is using material that um, we know uh, what the test results should be. So along with those patient results or before we report patient results, we have to test these materials and make sure that we get the results that we are supposed to. And if we don't, we have to figure out uh, why we're not getting the appropriate result and fix it. So we can't report patient results until we uh, correct those QC results. So that's just to ensure that the test that um, the results that we are giving the patients and the nurses, the physicians and the nurses are accurate. Question number two, how can lab scientists refrain from being exposed to pathogens or pathogens, pass or pathogens? Uh, that's a very good question, Raymond. Um, in the lab, we're exposed to all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, so to protect ourselves, we wear what's called our personal protective equipment, which we call PPE for short. And that includes a lab coat um, that protects us from spills. We wear gloves, uh, we wear goggles and face shields if there's a risk of splashing. Um, what else? Uh, sometimes depending on what type of test we're performing, performing we wear respirators. Um, you never want to eat or drink or smoke or apply chapstick or lipstick or anything like that um, in the laboratory. And that's because uh, the germs, the bacteria and viruses that you may have on your gloves or your hands 
If you're touching your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, you're introducing those pathogens into your mucous membranes. And so you have the potential to become sick. Um, you also want to wash your hands frequently. You want to wash your hands every time you remove your gloves. Uh, you want to wash your hands every time before work, when you're leaving work. Uh, you don't want to take anything home and make yourself or your family members sick. Um, and you also want to remember to uh, just clean and decontaminate your work surfaces. Uh, we do it before we work, after we get done working, um, while we're working, if our instruments get dirty or our, our bench counters get dirty. Uh, so you just want to um, remain clean and practice good housekeeping. Question number three. How do lab scientists test for illnesses? Um, that's another big question. Uh, it would take me all night to go through all of the tests that we perform in the laboratory. Um, but just to name a few, um, we examine cells and bacteria under the microscope. So we get uh, a patient specimen and whether it be blood or urine um, or whether it's bacteria that we actually grow in the lab on a Petri dish. Um, and we will get a sample of that, uh, make it spread it on a microscope slide and then we stain it with different dyes so that we can actually see things under the microscope. Um, and we can look under that microscope and we're taught to identify different cells, uh, different bacteria. Um, and so that helps us to figure out uh, what's going on with the patient. Um, in microbiology in particular is my favorite section of the lab. We actually grow bacteria. So we grow bacteria from a patient sample. We put a sample on a Petri dish that has auger in it. Um, and auger just um, is a medium that includes uh, sugars and carbohydrates, and um, it helps the bacteria to grow. And we grow those, we grow that bacteria and we can actually see the bacteria. And so we perform um, a variety of tests to identify what that bacteria is. It's kind of like a mystery. You have to figure out uh, what you're dealing with and what's making that patient sick. Um, and so we relay that to the doctors. Um, and we also test those bacteria uh, against a variety of antibiotics to help with the treatment plan. So in effect, we tell the doctors, this different antibiotic will work to treat this bacteria, but this one will not. Um, and then we also, uh, what I do at my particular job, uh, we produce and test blood products um, red blood cells, platelets, and plasma that we uh, transfuse to patients. Okay, um, question number four. How do laboratory scientists contribute to the overall medical field? Um, so I think it was mentioned in the earlier slide, um, over 70% of medical decisions are based on laboratory tests. Um, so that is huge in the treatment um, of patients. So without the laboratory, the doctors would just be guessing. They wouldn't have any definitive results to de definitively say that, yes, this is going on with this patient. Um, so we help, the, uh, pe we help the doctors in a sense, um, diagnose diagnose patients. Um, lab professionals, we like to say that we're the heart of healthcare. So just like a human being can't survive without a beating heart, healthcare can't survive without the laboratory. That's just how important we are. Um, most people don't know about laboratory professionals. If you say the lab, they immediately think about phlebotomists. And phlebotomists are um, a very important part of the lab team, but someone has to run all of those tests uh, behind the scenes from those specimens and that blood that the phlebotomist collects. Okay. Um, question number five. How do laboratory scientists communicate test results to physicians? 
Um, so most of the time we have um, hospitals or healthcare uh, facilities have an information system that's electronic. So most of the time we just enter the results into a computer system and the nurses and the doctors can see those results. Um, if the results are abnormal, uh, really abnormal, we call those critical resu results and we will actually call the nurse or call the doctor and relay those results, meaning, hey, you need to know about this so that you can um, treat this patient quickly or adjust your, your health plan quickly. Um, and then I've known some doctors that come actually come down into the lab and they wanna see things themselves. They wanna see the bacteria that, they, that we've grown. They want to see, um, they wanna see the microscope slides. Um, so it's really a collaborative effort between um, the laboratory, nurses, doctors, um, all of health, healthcare personnel. Question number six, which is the last question. What are the most prevalent illnesses seen in lab work? Um, so, um, so some of the most prevalent illnesses we see in the lab are um, anemia, which is uh, low iron in the blood, uh, diabetes, um, we regularly perform a test, it's called hemoglobin A1C, and basically that uh, monitors uh, diabetes over a long period of time. Um, we identify blood cells um, under the microscope that can assist in diagnosing cancers, particularly uh, cancers such as leukemias. Um, we perform testing that uh, help to diagnose heart disease, kidney disease, thyroid disease, um, and even some illnesses that aren't as, um, I guess, aren't as, as big as the ones I've, I've named, such as strep throat. You go to the doctor with a sore throat and they, they swab your throat. Uh, laboratory professional performs that test. Um, mono, uh, if you have a urinary tract infection, You'll give a, a urine sample and we'll test that urine. Um, in the last couple of years, COVID-19 has been uh, a huge illness that we see in the lab. Um, everything's about COVID. Um, so we, um, I know some people can do, you know, COVID tests in uh, their doctor's offices or even at home. Um, but the more specific molecular COVID tests, we perform all of those in the laboratory. Okay, thank you for um, answering my questions today. You're welcome. Okay, that concludes our Symposium. Thank you for joining us for this discussion panel today. I hope that you were able to learn some preventative measures and healthy habits to address the prominent health issues within the black community. Until next time, stay healthy, be encouraged, and be blessed.